Hello, this is part two of our learning module on memory processes. This is the second learning module on memory processes, memory two, and we're going to be talking about memory phenomena. Your textbook reviews several memory phenomena, and we're going to talk about them, some of them. It's a pretty long list. We're going to talk about a few of them in this lecture. This list goes on and on and on and on, way, way more than what's actually in the textbook and, or what we have time for in a mini lecture. The idea of this portion is just to give you some a landscape overview of some of the things that we've learned about how memory processes work. So, as a general definition, I will talk about memory phenomena as basically anything to do with human and animal memory. And in this section, we're going to use a slightly more specific laboratory definition, and we'll talk about memory phenomena as changes in memory measurements that result from experimental manipulations done in the laboratory. Let's begin. The picture superiority effect. Big question here is, is your memory better for different kinds of things? For example, is it better for pictures than words or uh, than other kinds of information? So in 1976, there's a paper, it's called Recognition Memory for Words and Pictures at Short and Long Retention Intervals, shows, showing evidence that people have much better memory for pictures compared to, say, words. I want to point out that I just changed some of the ways that I'm making slides here. And instead of, if, if you were using these slides yourself from the website, uh, notice that there's a new navigation bar here, and we can go down sometimes or to the next slide. So this slide, happens to the next one goes down here. So I just want to point that out. By the way, if you're looking at the slides on your web browser, you can press the O button on your keyboard and it shows that overview. So let's check out the picture superiority effect. Basically, if we look at some of the items that were presented, people studied repeated words synonyms. Uh, sometimes they studied words and were tested on pictures related to those words. So you could see the word fish, but you were tested on a picture of a fish. Or you could see pictures that were repeated, um, pictures that were similar to one another. Or you could study pictures and be tested on words. The basic finding was that if you were studying pictures, you did much better at remembering those pictures compared to words. We're looking at your percent correct on the memory test, and we're looking at performance as a function of delays. And they tested uh, delays of 10 minutes up to three months that's the amount of time that passes between the encoding phase and the memory test. And as we learned from Ebbinghaus, as we increase the delay, uh, people tend to forget things and their memory performance goes down. We see ev evidence of that here. The line goes down as the delay increases, but also memory for pictures is always higher than memory for words. So there appears to be something that we could call the picture superiority effect. More generally, different formats of information can uh, have an influence on how memorable they are. This is just a comparison between words and pictures. And if you started thinking about what comparisons between other formats, I'm sure we could find similar evidence of uh, uh, effects for different formats. Let's talk about frequency effects. So what do you think you remember better? Things that happen a lot 
or things that don't happen a lot. You do have better memory for more frequent or less frequent things. Now, the answer to this question really depends on things like how you test memory performance. So this is a paper from 1980. The title is Test Expectancy in Word Frequency Effects in Recall and Recognition. Now, we talked about the difference between a recall memory experiment, where you have to come up with the words yourself as evidence of what you remembered, versus a recognition memory experiment, where you're shown words and you have to say whether you saw them before or not. Let's check out what happened in this experiment. So if we read here in the abstract, people were induced to expect a recall or a recognition test. And then they were asked to remember a critical list containing both high frequency and low frequency words. So imagine you encoded a bunch of words, and some of them are really high frequency words. They, these are the kind of words that occur a lot in natural language. And some of the words were low frequency words. These are words that you haven't seen as many times in your life. Now, what's going to happen here? Are you going to have better memory for the words that you've seen many times in your life? Or are you going to have better memory for the words you haven't seen very many times in your life? Also, in this experiment, participants were given either a recall test or they were given a recognition memory test. Let's take a look at the results. Okay, here we've got a table and we have performance for high frequency words and low frequency words. We also have the kind of memory test that people were given. For example, people were given a recall memory test and some of those participants expected to be given a recall memory test and some of them expected to get a different test, the re recognition test. We also have people who got the recognition test. And what these numbers are, look at the top of the table, we have mean percent correct recall and mean percent correct recognition. All right. So one of the things we need to be able to do is look at a table like this and extract some of the answers. So um, let's look at the M line here. This is the means. So let's, we have a 25 and an 18 here, and let's compare that to the 18 and the 15 over there. What am I looking at? I'm seeing the people who did their recall test. They got about 20 ish, you know, between 25 and 18 words they remembered correctly when the words were high frequency. What about the low frequency words? Did they do better or worse? Well, 18 and 15, that's a little lower. So it seems that when you had to write down the words yourself in the recall test, you successfully wrote down more high frequency words and fewer low frequency words. So we might say, your memory was better for more frequent things than less frequent things. But hold on. What about the recognition test? We can look at that performance in the second row of the table. Let's go ahead and look at the memory performance here. So we're looking at a 55 and a 45. And I'm realizing I misspoke a little bit earlier. 
These aren't the number of items that people remembered, it's their mean percent correct. So their percent correct for recall was slightly higher for high frequency than low frequency. But what about recognition? Well here, percent correct is about 55 or 45, so that's like an average of about 50 for high frequency items, which is lower than 71% for low frequency items. So in the recognition test, people were much better at recognizing low frequency words compared to high frequency words. So the effect is completely in the opposite direction, depending on the kind of memory test you give people. And this is a nice example of how uh, we need to be careful about the conclusions we're making based on the memory tests that we use. All right, how about presentation rate and spacing? So how does study time influence your memory? What about spacing out your practice? This kind of thing could be relevant to, you know, how you study other kinds of material besides words. So in 1970, we have a paper by Melton, the situation with respect to the spacing of repetitions and memory. Let's take a look. This was an experiment where people were learning lists of words and the words were presented for different amounts of time. So you either had 1.3, 2.3, or 4.3 seconds to study each word. So that's one thing you might think, well, the, the more time you get, the better you'll be able to remember those things because you got to work on them longer. Another thing that happened here was that repetitions of the same word were separated or spaced out by 0, 2, 4, 8, 20, or 40 intervening words. So that means if you're practicing, the, say, see the word tiger for four seconds, you're like, all right, I'm going to remember tiger. And then you see more words. They'll give you a second chance sometimes. You'll see the word tiger again. And that would be a repetition. But um, how many words were in between is the spacing. So should you practice tiger, then practice tiger right away? Or should you practice remembering a word and then um, space out your practice so you do the thing you were practicing a little bit later and do some other stuff in between? Here's the results. This was a percent, rec percent correct recall in a recall task. Presentation rate is with the symbols. So triangles are lower than squares and circles are the top. People who had 1.3 seconds to study the words had worse memory compared to 2.3 seconds and 4.3 seconds. So the more time you had to encode the words, the better your memory was for those words. That's one effect, the effect of presentation rate. We can also look at the effect of number of events between two presentations. That's the space between the first time you practiced a word and the second time. And what happens here is as we increase the space from zero up to 40, memory performance gets better and better. So in this case, you're better off if you're trying to remember something, you shouldn't do two practice attempts of it right away. You should put a little space in between your practice attempts and that should help you retain that information over a longer period of time. People have studied spacing effects in, in many other instances, and it often has an influence on memory performance. All right, we're going to talk about two kinds of interference. Proactive interference is the first one. This happens when prior learning activities interfere with what you're trying to learn right now. If we're talking about learning lists of words, well, the more lists of words you already learned make it harder and harder to learn new lists of words. 
Why am I talking about learning lists of words? <laughs> well, let's look at a review paper from Underwood in 1957. It's called Interference and Forgetting. This is a graph that shows us really nice evidence for proactive interference. I'll say that during this time period, there was lab studying uh, memory processes. Participants would come into the lab, they would see a list of words, they would try to remember it for a later memory test. And oftentimes people will come back and do different memory tests. So they'd be repeatedly trying to memorize lists of words. Like some people were very practiced, they'd done this a lot and other people hadn't done it so much. In this graph, what we're looking at is performance on the memory test for a, a list based on how many previous lists you try to remember. So performance is pretty good if you haven't learned previous lists. But look what happens to memory performance for situations where you've already tried to remember many lists beforehand. Performance gets worse and worse. This is called um, a buildup of proactive interference. There's a similar example or a similar kind of thing. It's called retro retroactive interference. And this happens when new learning activities interfere with memory for past learning activities. Here's an example. Imagine in phase one, you're going to learn a list of 24 nonsense syllables. If you remember those things that Ebbinghaus was looking at, you learn these random syllables and then you do a memory test for those things, All right? So that's what you did. That's your first list. Now in phase two, there's going to be two groups. One group, they're going to get, they're called the experimental group. They'll get a second list and they've got to learn 24 new nonsense syllables. The control group, they don't have to learn any more syllables. They'll get a control task. So they're just going to read a magazine. So they're doing something. Now in the third phase, what we're going to do is give a memory test for the first list. So you got to go back and remember the first list. What happens here is in the table, we've got mean number of items correctly retained on the original test and retest. So the experimental group here, they remembered eight of 24 nonsense syllables in the first memory test. But look what, look how, uh, look what happened in the second memory test. They got 6.35. So they did worse. The control group, they got about 8.03 on the first memory test. And they got about 7.45 on the second one. So they forgot a little bit, but they didn't forget as much. The experimental group, remember, had to learn a second list. And retroactive interference is the finding that learning that second list uh, had a negative consequence for the things they had already learned in the first phase. The fan effect. I'm going to skip past this one. I'll, I'll, you can check out some of the evidence for it here. This is in the textbook. And I'm running out of time to get through all of our effects. So we're going to go on to the role of meaningfulness. Making information meaningful is a well-known technique to make things more memorable. It often works quite well. One example of this is called the self-reference effect. This shows that if you can find a way to relate information to yourself, it will often help you remember it better. Here's an example. People were given words to remember and they were given different tasks to do 
while they were encoding the words. One task was to judge whether the letters were big or small. Another one was to say, hey, does this word rhyme with another word? Another one was to ask the question, does this word that uh, mean the same thing as another word? And finally, there was the self-reference task. When you're looking at a word, you have to say, does this word describe you? So the tasks focused people um, on encoding different aspects of the word. And what happened was, if you were relating the word to yourself, you remembered that word better than, than if you were doing those other tasks. And we can see some of that evidence in this table here that we're looking at recall. Recall proportions go up and up and up as those tasks become more meaningful. And as you relate the word to yourself, which is um, in, in their experiment, they're thinking that could be a really meaningful thing for someone to do. That's where we have the best memory performance. So if that, tech, if that finding generalizes uh, and you're trying to remember new information, if you can find ways to relate it to yourself, then you should be able to remember that information better over the long term. Here's another famous example about the role of context in, in helping people and the hope, sorry, let me say the role of a meaningful context in helping people remember things. Here's a question. How well do you think you can understand and rep, uh, remember this paragraph? I'm not going to read it out, but I'll just have you pause the video and read this paragraph. The impression I get when I read this paragraph is I'm not really sure what it is talking about. There's sentences there, but it's a little bit confusing. So if you then gave yourself a memory test to try to write down all the sentences, how well do you think you would do? Turns out most people don't do that well because the sentences in that paragraph are pretty confusing. Now, in a famous study by Morris, uh, or sorry, by Bransford and Johnson, participants read that previous paragraph under different conditions, and they were shown picture contexts that help made sense of the uh, paragraph. This is called the full context picture. This is called the partial context picture. And if you reread that paragraph, whoops, here we go. If you reread this paragraph while looking at this full context picture, it make this pick this cartoon helps to make sense of what's going on in this paragraph. All right. So here's the findings. Participants who got the full context picture before they read the seemingly meaningless paragraph showed much higher comprehension and recall for the sentences in the paragraph. Um, this table shows measurements of comprehension of the sentences and recall of ideas in the sentences. And there's lots of different groups here, participants who just saw the paragraph one time, they got low scores. Some participants got to see the paragraph two times and they got slightly better. Some participants saw the, read the paragraph and then they got to see the picture after they read the paragraph and that didn't really help very much. There was a partial context picture that sort of explained what was going on. And if participants saw that, they did a little bit better. But look, these numbers almost double. When the full context picture was presented before the paragraph, this allowed participants uh, some meaningful way to organize the sentences, and that caused them to be able to comprehend them and recall them at a much higher rate. Some more uh, general influences of context and there's lots of evidence that the environment that you're in can influence your memory. Have you ever had the experience of like walking into a room to go get something and you're like, what am I doing here? <laughs> uh, that's happened to me before. 
And what I'll often do is go back to where I w was and uh, when I, so for example, I walk into the living room, like, what am I doing here? Hmm, can't remember. So I go back to the kitchen and then I'm like, oh, now I remember what I was, and then I go back to the living room. So it's like the kitchen is sort of a great context for cueing me with the goal that I had to go in the living room and say, find my keys. When I get in the living room, I'm no longer in the kitchen. And so the context is not reminding me uh, why I was going into the living room. So I go back to the kitchen and now I'm back in that context where I formed that goal for myself. That helps me remember what my goal is. So it's almost like the memories you're having can be bound to the context that you're in. Many people have had experiences like this. This has led researchers to try to produce these effects in, in more controlled environments. Uh, famous paper is by Godin and Badley from 1975. It's called Context Dependent Memory in Two Natural Environments on Land and Underwater. Here's what they did. They had underwater divers encode words either on, on land, so they were, they went, took them out to a diving session, so they're just, they're near a lake. And these divers read a list of words on the land, or they went underwater and were asked to read a list of words underwater. So there's these two locations where you could read the words. And then they attempted to recall words either in the same place where they encoded them or in the other place. Let's see what happened. So we've got a learning environment that's dry or wet, and we've got a recall environment that's dry or wet. If you learn the words on in the dry environment, you try to recall them in the dry environment. You got about 13. Similarly, if you learn the words underwater and you tried to recall them underwater, you did a little worse, got about 11, 11 and a half. Those are situations where the encoding environment, and the recall environment were the same, so they matched. Let's look at the situations where the encoding environment and the recall environment were different. So if you could have learned the words in a dry environment and then tested in the wet environment. Those participants did about 8.6. It's lower. Participants who learned the words underwater and then were tested on land got 8.4. When your encoding environment and retrieval environment were the same, people did better. When the encoding and retrieval environment were different, people did worse. All right, the last one we're going to do here is called the testing effect. And we'll see if I can finish up in about by, by the 30 minute mark or slightly after. This will probably go about to 35 minutes. A big question here is, does quizzing yourself help you remember things? The title of this paper is from 2006. It's Test Enhanced Learning, Taking Memory Tests Improves Long-Term Retention. I'll note there's going to be some midterm questions about this paper, and I'll post it on Blackboard as something you can read about. What is the testing effect? This is a phenomenon showing that better memory for material that was tested and successfully recalled or recognized um, compared to material that was not tested. So you might have better memory for a concept if it was on a quiz compared to concepts that were not quizzed. If you were to go and grab that paper and read it, you'd see that in previous research, testing effects had usually been obtained for word lists, picture lists, or multiple choice questions. And the question of the current research was whether this effect would generalize to more educationally relevant conditions. For example, 
Could the testing effect be obtained using prose materials and free recall tests without feedback? And would the benefits extend beyond restudying the material? Here's what happened in experiment one. The main question was, will the testing effect occur for prose materials and free recall tests without feedback? We'll talk about what all that means. Here's the method. 120 participants studied two passages. One was about the sun, and one was about sea otters. The passages were around 256 to 275 words in length. You could think about these things that are just like information about the sun or sea otters, maybe taken from Wikipedia or something like that. The researchers divided each passage into 30 idea units. They, this was how they were able to score people's recall and comprehension. So later on, you would have to uh, write down all things you could remember from the passage that you read. And the researchers were looking to see if you got all 30 different things that were in the passage. The design was called a, uh, the design was a two by three mixed factorial design. The factor with two levels was the learning condition. One group of people, they read a passage and they got to restudy it. So that is reading the passage two times, the restudy condition. The other group of people were, was, uh, they got to read the passage one time and then they had to do a test about the contents of the passage. Now, the second factor of manipulation was the delay to the memory test. So after you did the original learning, you waited five minutes or two days or one week to come back and do the final test. Just to walk through this a little bit more, in phase one, participants studied a passage for the first time. Then they either restudied the passage, that's one group, or they were given a recall test and they had to remember as much of the material as they could. All right, so that's what happened in phase one for either the restudy group or the test group. Now, after that, everybody was given a final test. The final test happened five minutes after phase one ended, two days after, or a week after. Everyone had to now do a final recall test. So what happened in this experiment? You might also pause at, at this point, try to predict what you think might have happened in this experiment. One group of people got to read that passage two times. So will they do better on the final memory test? The other group of people only got to read the passage one time. Then they did a memory test and they did a memory test again. So, I mean, they only got to read it one time. What's going to happen for, for their memory? Are they going to do better on that final memory test? Let's look at the results. Here they are. We have the study study group. That's the group that got to read the paragraph two times and they did the best after a five minute delay. They remembered about 80% of the idea units. But look what happens to this group's memory if we test them again in two days, or sorry, we wait two days to test them or wait one week, their memory goes down quite steeply. So by the end of a week, they've forgotten the most. The light gray bars are the group that studied the passage one time and then immediately did a, a recall test. If we waited five minutes to give them the final memory test, we see that they didn't quite remember as much as the group that got to study the paragraph two times. But look what happens over longer delays they retain more information, so they're forgetting less 
over time. So studying one time and then giving yourself kind of recall tests, like what do I remember about that? That seemed to help people remember material from the first study session for longer periods of time. We can look at their second experiment. Uh, the question here is, what are the effects of repeated restudying versus retesting on memory for the passages? We could think about this like a cost benefit analysis. I'm just looking for, I don't know, here it's a, here's a book. <laughs> it's called, You Are a Cat. And let's say I'm trying to remember all the information on page 60. So I could read it one time and I could close the book and try to remember it all. And that would be like studying it once and testing myself once. Now, if I really want to remember this stuff, what should I do? I mean, I could just, I could read it two times. That would be studying it twice. I could read it three times. That'd be studying it three times. I, I could keep doing that. Um, or I could keep testing myself. Or a little bit of both. What's going to have a better payout for me at the end? Should I study, 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 study a lot with no testing or, or what? So in this experiment, subjects learned one of two passages under one of three conditions. There was a repeated study condition, and this is where you got to read that paragraph four times. Study, 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 study. Or you could study three times, study that paragraph once, twice, a third time, and then give yourself a test. Or what about kind of the opposite? You study the paragraph one time, and then you give yourself a test, and another test, and another test. So you test three times. There was also different amounts of delays here between encoding and retrieval. Let's see what happened. So the black bar is the group that got to study the paragraph four times. After a five minute delay, they had the best overall memory. But after a week, they had the worst memory. So the people who studied this thing four times remembered the most right away, and they forgot the most after a whole week. What about the group that got to study three times and give, give themselves one memory test? They remembered slightly less after five minutes. They forgot quite a bit over the whole week, but they, re they did remember more than the group that didn't do any memory test. Finally, we have the group that only got to study the paragraph one time, but as part of their practice, they gave themselves a memory test three times. So those participants remembered the least amount after five minutes, but no, no, they still were remembering quite a bit, 70% of the stuff. But look how much they remembered after a week. They, they remembered the most. So one study followed by the tests allowed people to retain more information over the long term. We just reached the end of our part two on memory phenomena, and the last part is on memory principles. So come back and take a look at that one. See you in a bit.